Today we're going to have an interview with author Patricia Pearson. Patricia and I have a long history. We attended high school together in New Brunswick, Canada. In fact, Patricia was my first girlfriend. Later, we both attended Trinity College at the University of Toronto. When I moved out of my apartment in New York City, Patricia took over the lease in Soho. And in the early 2000s, she authored a series of articles for the National Post newspaper called Who Killed Teresa, which was some of the foundational work on my sister's unsolved murders and became sort of the nexus point for everything that came after that. And then finally, of course, uh, over the last two or three years, we authored and in September published the book Wish You Were Here. There's some bumps along the way in the course of this interview. A cat meows, someone's phone beeps. I kind of chafe at anything that has even the slightest whiff of so-called professionalism. This is who killed Teresa. Heavenly eyes come see the moon. I think it's shining. Oh, would you rather up my room? For wine and dining. Imagine me, imagine you. Patricia Pearson is with us today. She's uh, an author of uh, many books, but um, most recently uh, she is celebrating the reissue, re-release of her first book, When She Was Bad, How and Why Women Get Away with Murder. Patricia, welcome. Hi, John. How are you? <clears throat> I'm as well as can be in the bleak midwinter in lockdown during a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, and now we're pretending like we don't talk like every second day. <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> so I, I, um, I want to talk about when she was bad. Um, as I said, it's the it's the first thing you wrote, and um, I'm I guess I'm first curious um, about the original publication, and um, what uh, you know, what brought you to this idea about writing about women who kill, uh, and how difficult a sell that was, and what was the whole process like in in bringing that to publication. At the time, I was I had been a crime journalist in New York City in the late 80s and early 90s. So I was covering a number of murder trials, um, went back to Toronto and covered the trial of um, the sort of celebrated Canadian and infamous Canadian uh, serial killer team of Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamalka. That was 1995. <clears throat> and at that point, I began to realize that whenever I saw women um, on trial, uh, they were always oversimplified by the media um, and often by, you know, even the lawyers in terms of what their motives could possibly be that would bring them to behave in this way that was somehow abnormal and not female, that it was male. And so it was always like um, either they were, they were insane or... Um, they were driven to it by a, a Svengali figure that had manipulated them into doing something they wouldn't ordinarily do. Um, or, or, you know, um, they had the childhood of abuse and that was the immediate um, explanation where, in fact, you know, most uh, violent criminals do have childhoods of abuse. But with men, it doesn't come rushing to the fore as an excuse, but with women, it does. So I just... I just wanted to kind of take that on and say, well, wait a minute, you know, what is actually going on with women when they're violent? And, you know, could it be that, um, you know, it's just a part of it's sort of the, the, the shadow side of expressing power and having agency. Um, and so that's how I dove into it. The, the original book covers an, a number of sort of sub genres. There's, 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 
women who kill newborns and infants. Um, there's, there's women in prison. There's, um, multiple murderesses is one section. Um, um, women w with partners, uh, and, and, and being in violent relationships. Can, can, for, for, for listeners, can you kind of give us, I, I, I don't know what the best of, uh, of, of, <laughs> of, of, of when she was, when she was bad. Well, what I did was I took a number of different um, fairly high profile cases um, and and looked at, you know, wh what does this tell us about why women get involved in these crimes? So, for, ex for example, when women are partners in violent crime, you've got Myra Henley and uh, Ian Brady in England. Um, there's a couple of other cases of team serial killers in England. Um, of course, Bonnie and Clive. Um, or is it Clyde? Bonnie and Clyde. I like Bonnie and Clive. And Clive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carla Hamalka and Paul Bernardo. Um, and always the explanation for, for the women's involvement was that um, they were tag along, right? So, you know, or they were abused by the men. So they didn't seek really want to be involved in murder and mayhem, but they didn't have any choice or they were easily manipulated. And then when I sort of looked into it, um, it, what I realized was that actually what's going on there um, in many cases that, that these are women that want to um, uh, take those risks and, um, you know, draw pleasure from um, the, the recklessness and the, and the danger, but they don't feel they have any kind of social permission. So it's almost like they're, they're getting involved with men who can lead the way to give them um, a kind of permission to to be violent. So that that was one thing I looked at that I found really interesting. Another one was um, something called Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which is when um, mothers will repeatedly injure their children in order to seek attention from healthcare. Um, and again, this was something that. Well, first of all, it's something that um, is rarely caught, so it takes a long time for. Uh, the healthcare system to realize that these mothers are being deliberately injurious to their children, but it also inevitably became a question of, well, they must be insane. They must be mentally ill. Whereas in fact, what I was seeing was that this was just a kind of female form of psychopathy that they, <clears throat> that, you know, that they took pleasure in kind of controlling the story and in puzzling all of these doctors. Um, and, you know, whereas heartless as a, as a male, a, a man who is being abusive. So there's all these different ways in which women can engage in violence um, that is really very similar in motive to men, but in dif is different in terms of their modus operandi. So it looks different, but it's motivated by the same classic things of power, greed, lust, uh, rage. You brought it up twice, so I, I, I kind of want to touch on it a bit. The The Paul Bernardo... Carla Homolka case, which um, um, depending on where you sit, um, you, either, you either know very, very well, or maybe you perhaps you don't know at all, or maybe you've forgotten about it. My recollection of that case was um, like one of the major, major criminal investigative problems with that case was the, the, the obtuse blind spot the police had from, from the get go. And the way I, correct me if I'm wrong, the way I'm, I'm remembering it is she went to the police, Carla, and cut a sweetheart deal in order to finger him. And then, of course, they find these tapes and, and, and what they learn from these tapes with the victims is that she was um, not only a willing participant, in some ways, the, the dominant of the two. Am, am I getting that right? Yeah, that was a case where... Uh... Bernardo had been a serial rapist um, for many years. He wasn't caught, but in retrospect, he had been. He was known, in fact, as the Scarborough Rapist. Um, but then he hooked up with Carla Hamolka, and there was this kind of alchemy between them um, that, that elevated it to the next level. And they started by killing, raping and killing her own sister, her younger sister, and then from there, they, they abducted and killed two 14-year-old um, schoolgirls in a small city in Canada um, that was completely terrorized by the abduction and disappearance of these girls. And 
at some point, I can't remember actually how Carla Hamalka came to the attention of the police, whether she walked in and, uh, I, I, yeah, I think she probably brought herself to their attention. They and were claimed closing in, was, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and then and she claimed that she was abused, that she was a battered wife. Um, and she cut a deal with them that she would testify against Bernardo in exchange for a 12-year uh, manslaughter sentence. Um which is what happened. And then as, and then they found these videotapes cause they'd videotaped the, the murders uh, and the rapes, but actually they'd videotaped the rapes and the murders had happened off camera. Um, and so it was never clear and remains unclear actually to this day, whether in fact it was Bernardo or was it Hamalka herself who actually murdered these girls. And there's some conflicting evidence to suggest that it may have been her in fact. So it was, it, it was a very, very traumatizing trial to sit through because there was so much video evidence that we had to listen to, that the juries, jurors had to watch a rape um, of young girls. Um, I think all of us got PTSD from that trial. And what was so fascinating was watching Hamalka on the witness stand providing her testimony to Dan Bernardo. And she was so... Uh, she was so obviously um, emotionally empty. Like she was so clearly sociopathic mm -hmm. and, and all of the women in the courtroom could see that. Um, and then you have this, this, these, you know, prosecuting attorneys who are damned if they're not going to prove that she's just a battered wife. And it, it really caused a kind of soul searching uproar around um, whether women can just cloak themselves in any kind of victimhood. And by definition in, of being female, simply get away with it, which is what happened. She got out of jail and went down to live in the Caribbean. Yeah. Apart from the, the Picton case in British Columbia, I, I, have a, I can't recall a case in Canada that felt just so all consuming like, like that. Yeah, it really was. It was it was on the radio every single day. Every single newscast started with an update from that trial. The whole country got traumatized by that case. Mm -hmm. um, so well, this was originally published in the in the early nineties. Am I right? Late eighties, early nineties. Is that correct? Mark? Late. No, it was uh, my the, the book was published in nineteen ninety seven. Okay. Okay. And um, because I have a chapter in there exploring um, what happens when women are the abusers in um, love relationships, I'm not talking about women who are abused in domestic violence. I'm talking about other relationships where the woman is the abuser. Um, that was a real hot potato at that time um, from, a, from, from feminists. So I got called an anti-feminist because I was exploring what happens when the man is the victim, um, you well, know, that's exactly where I, I, I wanted to go. Yeah. I mean, eventually the book, you know, it, it wins in 97, the Arthur Ellis award for best true crime. Uh, it's considered now like it's a, it's a globe and mail, a best book. Um, I think in, in retrospect, it's one of, I think my, my memory of it is it introduced me to, to true crime before I was directly involved in true crime. That's my memory of it. Yeah, the, right. And, and, and it was a very early influence on, uh, on, uh, on me. You know, I, um, I had to, I had to kind of rummage in the house to find my original copy of it, but there it was, you know, next to Anne rule. That's a kind of thing. But what I want to get to all of that is to lead to is to say, what was the original reaction? What was the response in 1997? Well, I mean, I, it, it was critically well-received, um, and it was published all over the world. Um, and, and in fact, it wound up being on course list with homicide investigators, which I thought was great. Um, and also taught, taught at universities at Cambridge and Yale and uh, um, at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. So, I feel like I contributed to people's understanding of what they were missing about violent women. But at the same time, you know, it, it, I was, you know, really pilloried for daring to bring up the subject, which of course is the point of the book. So if you're going to say that 
people are really uncomfortable with the idea of women being violent, then they are going to be really uncomfortable <laughs> with the idea of women being violent and they don't want to read your book. So <laughs> um, I remember being on the BBC radio in London and uh, I had like, it was like a 30 second time slot and I was, you know, on the phone and the BBC announcer said, Patricia Pearson, you are saying that women are more evil than men. It's like, <laughs> And would you, you care know, to comment? You just, <laughs> it's really hard in a world that that um, yes or no in a world that's all about branding and simplification and mm. high concept to write a book that insists that things are more complicated and more nuanced is a very tough thing to do. But I think it found the people that needed to read it, including um, abused men. So. So now with the, the new publication, you've, you've added a, a chapter at the beginning yeah. called Angels of Death, When Healers Do Harm. And it's, it's about caregivers who kill. I, I wondered if this is, if you're able, there's a section I kind of primed you for to read. I wondered if you'd kind of tee off our conversation about that new chapter with with a reading ready yeah amy archer gilligan born one halloween night in the late 19th century murdered husbands to cash in life insurance policies that financed the nursing homes she ran whose residents she poisoned the authorities counted 48 deaths at the archer home for the elderly and infirm that they thought were at her hands rather than due to natural causes. In popular culture, her crime spree sparked not gothic tales of Jack the Ripper, but a comedic play, Arsenic and Old Lace, which nicely sums up the difference in how we regard serial killers by gender. In July 2018, a British healthcare worker was arrested on the suspicion that she had murdered eight babies and tried to kill six others while she worked at the Countess of Chester Hospital in northwestern England. Days later, there were reports that a Japanese nurse had been arrested on the suspicion that she'd injected disinfectant into intravenous bags, killing approximately 20 elderly patients in her care at Yokohama Hospital. So this subgenre of serial murderer continues to flourish. The question worth asking ourselves, and the men of Quantico, is whether we aren't looking out for such killers because we don't truly value their victims, or because we cannot abandon the image of nurturing women. Contrary to preconceived notions about women being incapable of these extreme crimes, as the psychologist Harrison and her collaborators concluded in 2015, the women in our study poisoned, smothered, burned, choked, bludgeoned, and shot newborns, children, elderly, and ill people, as well as healthy adults, most often those who knew and likely trusted them. This was the same point I made when I first published this book. Unconscious biases are incredibly difficult to erase. you touch on earlier in the chapter is um, the fact that uh, the, um, the, the, the um, I guess it's the behavioral psychology unit at Quantico, Virginia for the FBI declared to you that all ser serial killers are, are male. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I went down it to, I guess, Western Virginia or, uh, anyway, wherever they are, just outside of Washington. Virginia, City. yeah. In, um, God, when I was working in New York, so sometime in the early 90s, and interviewed them for an article I was writing about serial killers. And I remember them distinctly telling me um, that, you know, among the various characteristics of a serial killer, one was that they were 100% um, male, that it was, you know, there were no, no women did this. And the reason that they think that way is because Quantico um, is designed um, as a, a way of catching a suspect whose bodies you have found. 
And the thing about female serial killers and also about women who commit certain kinds of other violence is that you don't find the bodies for a long time. So they, because, because there's an absence of suspicion, mm. because they will prey upon people who you can write off as having been elderly and died, you know, naturally, or of babies that have uh, died of uh, SIDS. Um, and so they will get away with it for quite a long time before they are um, arrested. And by then, all the bodies are then discovered. So it's kind of a reverse process to what Quantico psychological profiling was designed to actually do. And so if, you know, if everything, if all you've got is a hammer, then everything is a nail, right? So their very methodology precluded them from seeing female serial killers out there. So the, the, the focus of interest in the chapter is uh, Elizabeth Wetlaufer, yeah. um, who many in Canada know, but uh, I, there, we have listeners from primarily from the United States, but also the UK and, and Australia. Could, could you give us a little profile of who uh, Elizabeth Wetlaufer was and, and what she did? Yeah, so so this was a, a nurse in a series of um, long-term care homes um, here in Canada who, over the course of um, a decade during her career, would overdose um, her patients with insulin, um, which is an extremely difficult thing to tell in autopsy. And also, when people die in long-term care homes, they are rarely, in fact, if ever, autopsied. So just to see from right now with the COVID-19 crisis and the number of people dying in long-term care home, I mean, you literally could have serial killers having a field day right now and no one would notice. So this woman was typical of that. She was, she was overdosing and killing people in a series of long-term care homes um, completely without drawing any attention. Um, and in fact, the only reason that they even know that this happened was because she started to make mistakes that made her worry that she was going to get caught because she read an article that said something like, you know, how to tell if your nursing colleague is a killer. It was like an article in psychology today that they found on her computer. Um, and so she was, she had made a couple of mistakes and she was worried that she was going to be cornered. And so she decided to go to a psychiatric hospital, get herself admitted and um, announced that she had uh, basically been a serial killer for the previous 10 years um, and gave them full descriptions of all of her crimes. And then after she was convicted by pleading guilty, moved herself to a psychiatric hospital. Um, and so that to me was such a compelling example of how easy it is for a serial killer operating with a low value victim um, to get away with it. And that's a big chunk of why we miss the fact that women can be violent. And uh, I, I recall when, when this story was uh, initially breaking, uh, even I was kind of sold on uh, some first impressions that kind of painted it as well. These must have been mercy killings. You know, there was, there was a brush stroke of that initially. Well, surely she's a caregiver. Giver. She must have been, you know, you know, she's only trying to help, which is astonishing to me that that was the case. Yeah, I mean, and of course, she she made it very clear that that was not the case in her in her testimony. Um, you know, she got a thrill out of it. She hated them. They irritated her. She killed them because she had a relationship breakup and she was mad um, and took it out on on an elderly man. Um so it, it, it's, you know, very similar in motive to the way male serial killers behave, but with this rush to explain. And another example of that is actually Eileen Warnes, who many still have a tendency to consider as somehow the only female serial killer. Um, and, you know, documentaries have been made about her and films with Charlize Theron starring have been made about her. And in fact, she is... Um, a, f a pretty classic uh, version of a male serial killer, um, you know, put, you know, to strolling highways, um, picking up strangers or having them pick her up and then murdering them with a gun. That's that's unusual for a woman. Um, but otherwise, she's very similar to a male serial killer um, in terms of her childhood of neglect and abuse and in terms of her using these 
victims as kind of symbolic targets of her rage. And instead, we got this huge um, scaffolding of explanation around Hornos that was all about her childhood abuse. Whereas Charles Manson's mother literally would leave her for him alone as a five-year-old for five, six days and go off with motorcycle gang friends. And he would scavenge in the garbage for food. And that never comes up. So either both of them you want to look first at their um, what formed their character or or neither. You know, it's but it's very gendered in how we approach that. <clears throat> and and at one point she's she's actually caught. Right. Uh, one of the administrators, I, I believe it's at the Caressant Care, I've, says they they have a hearing with her where they say, but but if you ever do this again, we will have to turn you into the police. And my my reaction at that point in the in reading this was, what the holy fuck? I, 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 <laughs> yeah, that that wasn't the administrator. That was actually a a, a priest and his wife, right? Who she confessed to. And they said, well, Elizabeth, you know, if you ever do that again, we're going to have to tell the police. She just told them that she's a serial killer. Right. right. And so, <laughs> it's, it's, again, it's, a, it's the, the, it's the blind spot. It's like that, that we don't want to see what just is right in front of our eyes. I mean, we have discussed this before in, in a book I think we consider to be, um, uh, very influential, uh, Bill James's Man from from the Train, where, yeah. where no one could see what was right in front of their eyes. I I, I don't want to put you on the spot. Can, can do you remember a little bit about the premise of that book? And yeah, I mean, it, it was it was that the, the 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 murderer was jumping on and off trains, and and killing and then getting back on a train and going to a different location. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, before anyone had ever really heard of serial killers um, as such. And so the original suspicion of the police in every given location was that it might have something to do with the train and the train tracks. The victims were near the train tracks. But then they would immediately dismiss that because it was so outside of their bailiwick as a, as a thing that could happen. And they instead would focus on local African-Americans or, um, you know, a boyfriend or a disgruntled ex-partner or something. Right. So, well, I mean, all it, too it, often ending up in a lynching, right? Uh, yeah, and, and, people were right. lynched for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah and yeah. actually, that's that's another example of the way this blind spot works that I noticed with interest a while ago, which was the case where the woman in Central Park um, tried to frame the black bird watcher in, in New York in, yes. in the spring, remember? And it was, it was a right around the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement really getting um, momentum. And what I found interesting is that actually what she was doing is, I mean, it was framed in terms of a narrative that we're now paying attention to, which is racism. But in fact, what she was doing is a, not an untypical form of female aggression which is threatening somebody to with using the system against them as opposed to directly punching somebody in the face, which they can't do because they're not as strong. They will bring the system into play. Um, and, <clears throat> but we don't see that. We're not seeing her as a female aggressor. We're seeing her as a racist. So the narrative that we choose to focus on at any given time is what we see. It's like a foreground background imaging um, you know, paradox. You, you know what I mean? Like yeah. when you can't focus on the visual and the foreground and the background at the same time. Well, I think I think the example everybody leapt to, uh, and it was sprang to my mind was this sort of the, the the Henry Louis Gates Obama beer summit. It's a teachable moment, and and you know it, it all got framed with you know that history. And as you're saying, yeah, it's like wait, is- there's something else going on here. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it was appropriate for in terms of what the focus was on, which was because we wanted to be able to talk about racism. But it was also an example of what women will do. And if that man had been white and she had pulled a similar deal, not, not unlike Carla Homolka did, um, we would have missed it. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, um, 
in 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 other similarities I, 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 with with uh Wetlaufer, I, I found it interesting um you know as you say she, she she after she's caught she concocts this story that moves her from a prison to a hospital she claims she heard voices in her head um not unlike peter sutcliffe who yeah. uh, when he was caught immediately said that you know the 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 two the gravestones were were talking to him and claiming schizophrenia this kind yeah. of um and the other the other and then that got me thinking the other parallel is um you know sutcliffe was was jokingly referred to at his place of em- employment as the as uh, as the Yorkshire Ripper, truckers would call him that because it seemed so absurd. Well, it, it couldn't be Pete, and this was the case with uh, Wetlaufer as well, correct? Yeah, that's right. Other nurses would joke that she was the angel of death. Astounding. I mean, it, you know, it's interesting because, in fairness to most of us, you know, it would it's pretty hard to fathom that a person that you're working with on a day to day basis is actually a murderer. Um, and, and, you know, like when you and I were doing Wish You Were Here and, and the, the, the landlady of Luke Gregoire out in Calgary was absolutely blown sideways by the revelation that he was a killer after he had lived with her for a year. Right. It's, I mean, you know, it's, and they, and they will, they will, they will make that possible by being very good at deceiving you about, you know, their, their inner life. Well, uh, I mean, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. And and a lot in in wish you were here, that that portion doing with with um, Luke's landlady, uh, w- which you did most of the writing on that is 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 almost played comic comically and rightly so because it was you know oh Luke you've left blood on the walls again you know this kind of thing uh, because that but it, it's not it's comic in the point of view that that was her impression of Luke that he was just this fumbling you know, puppy who, you, you know, he needed a meal and a bath and to be taken care of. It, they're the last thing that she would have thought was that, you know, he was offing prostitutes on the stroll in Calgary. Yeah, you know, uh, and so I guess the question becomes, how do you, you know, what do you, so it, it, it's, it, what you need is you need to follow their actions rather than their charm or their words or their or your preconceptions about their um, inherent morality. Um, and so often in these cases, there will be a pattern of. So, for example, the woman who was arrested in England um, at the Countess of Chester Hospital for killing babies. Uh, she was actually arrested in 2018. Then they let her go. Then they arrested her in 2019. Then they let her go. Then they arrested her again in November 2020. This is how hard it is to actually make it stick in terms of what evidence you can accrue with, in this case, um, newborn babies, because um, it's so easy to conceal the way that you've killed them. Um, but the reason that they became aware of and called in the police to investigate at the hospital at all was because they were seeing a pattern, a pattern of babies dying on her particular shift. So even though she was like a really nice person and everyone thought she wouldn't hurt a fly and she was, you've <laughs> got to look at the pattern of, of what's going on. And, and, you know, that's your, I guess, your only trail that you can follow. We're speaking with Patricia Pearson, author of When She Was Bad, How and Why Women Get Away with Murder. The book was just re-released by Penguin Random House. Towards the end of the chapter, you mention uh, that uh, Wetlaufer's story, I guess, was turned into a play. 
at the Blythe yeah. F- Festival um, uh, near Lake Huron. And I, th- I thought that section was really interesting because I thought, again, I mean, I understand why they wouldn't want to focus on the serial killer, but yeah. they took her completely out of the story and made it more about the system, which is a little odd for, um, you know, human centered performing arts. <laughs> I, I thought, <clears throat> Well, I'm, I'm not even sure they made it about the system. I think they made it about a family feeling guilty about putting their loved one in long-term care home. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is its own, you know, giant ongoing issue for sure. But if that, I mean, in a sense, that's that's the equivalent to um, taking the story of <sighs> Jeffrey Dahmer and making a play about a family that feels badly that their son ran away from home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because his victims were mostly, you know, drifters. It, young it, drifters. it sounded like the kind of thing that was conceived with the end game in mind, which is a really thought provoking conversation at the talk back after a show where we can engage the community. Wouldn't that be great if we had a focused conversation on what to do with our, our ailing parents and then, yeah. they, and then they backed into a drama from that. It was very, very bizarre. Yeah. Very bizarre. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like arsenic and old lace. You take the serial killer in 19th century America and, and turn it into a, a, a comical play that you and I both starred in when we were 15 years old. Full disclosure, we did. The first play we were, <laughs> Patricia and I were in, in grade 10, <laughs> believe it or not was arsenic and old lace. Patricia was one of the murdering aunts and I was Mortimer Brewster. <laughs> and little did we know. Little did we know. And and to to be fair, we didn't make that connection until very no. recently, right? <laughs> yeah. I I know. I know. It's quite funny. Um I, I want to talk a little bit about your other writing. You're not just a you're not just a crime writer, uh, a, a true crime writer, uh, fiction. Uh, uh, you wrote um, history of anxiety, yours and mine, about mm-hmm. phobias, and and uh, and then you wrote um, possibly. Um, well, I, I think it's the book that's most widely known, "Opening Heaven's Door." about um, afterlife experiences. And with these, you brought this up. I wondered if you'd comment. People sometimes tend to think that because you focus on a subject that you are, that is who you are and that that subject all consumes you. So when you write about the, you know, the afterlife, it's like, well, Patricia's obviously, um, her life is consumed with, you know, the grieving process of d- dead relatives or when you write the history of anxiety, Oh, poor Patricia, she's got phobias and, and some mental health issues. You want to talk a little bit about that? Cause I find it really interesting. Well, I think that comes back again to this branding issue of the 21st century. Um, it, it you know, which I, I, you know, I, I, I complicate branding. Um, I, I, I really, I'm all over the map because um, the subjects that interest me um, are from a wide and rich tapestry of the lives that we live. Um, And uh, funnily enough, George Saunders, the Booker Prize winning writer, um, was asked what he was reading in a recent interview. uh, And he said, my book, Opening Heaven's Door. And he described me as a science writer. (laughs) Mm. So I was like, okay, there we go. Well, two months ago, I was a crime writer, and now I'm a science writer. And uh, sometimes I'm a humorist, and sometimes I'm, you know, it's a, a memoirist. And so it's 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 the times that we live in where people need to have a particular handle for who you are, what your product is, what you're delivering. Um, and I just can't behave myself with respect to that. I've never wanted to follow up a particular book with another book in the same vein because I've lost interest in the subject. 
and I want to go and do something else. Um, so it's an interesting quandary for a writer. So people who've read, for instance, my two comic novels, which are mostly about women and, and, and pregnancy, um, those people would, you know, they would go, oh, I want to read another Patricia Pearson book. And then they'd come across, you know, when she was bad. And they'd be like, <laughs> oh, I don't want to read that. So, you know, there's very little crossover in, in, in my readership between my different books. Right. Um, and I can understand now, in a way I never did before, why certain novelists use pen names for some of their books so that they can write in a slightly different way. And Richard not... Bachman, right? Was, yeah. Was, mm-hmm. yeah. Stephen King. Um, well, because because their fans get uh, get confused. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I confuse people. Anything else you'd like us to know about um, when she was bad? Um, I, I mean, I think I think the point of really what I was doing in exploring some of these cases was trying to restore the complexity of women. And so I'm not making sweeping generalizations. I'm not saying that women are more evil than men. I'm not saying that women are equally violent to men either. It depends on what category of, of crime you're looking at. Um, but what I'm saying is that if we want to go into the infantry and the police force and uh, the boxing ring um, and the head of be the head of corporations and you know in, engage in the battle of, of, of uh, wits in the, in the courtroom, then we have to understand that we're also capable of of turning that ferocity and that strength um, and that will into n- negative places the same as men do. So, you know, that's all. And we have to understand that it's when we're, we're talking about human non-gendered victims, victims of both sexes, victims of all ages. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's an uncomfortable reality. Um, um, but it's not a, uh, by any stretch, a um, um, invisible one that many people wouldn't recognize on some level in terms of their own experience. The book is When She Was Bad, How and Why Women Get Away with Murder. And I've been speaking with Patricia Pearson. Uh, I, I got I got my edition in the mail from you. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, just today, I will... Great. I will send it off to my mother who was like, oh, oh, I'd like to read that. (laughs) Okay. Um, (laughs) um, It is available. uh, I I, I just checked uh, in in this time around. This one is available in Canada, the United States, in the UK and in Australia. At the very least, unless you know where else people can buy it. Yeah. yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I haven't been paying attention to that part, but I, I know it's coming out as um, an audible book as well in uh, uh, next week. Oh, fantastic! Um, yeah. Well, we are audible. We are an audible um, venue here, so that's that's fantastic. And and with that, I know you've got dinner, and um, uh, I have to do something similar as well. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today on. Uh, uh, who killed Teresa? And uh, thank you for having me, John. <laughs> you're most most welcome, and uh, uh, I, I I wish you great great success with um, when she was bad. I hope um, I hope this reignites interest in in the book again because I think it's well deserving. I, it's it's one of the best true crime books I've read. Oh, thanks, John. We shall see. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye. A couple of final thoughts as we close things out here today. Uh, I was thinking in doing this interview that, um, you know, our moms, Patricia's mom and mine, uh, have this, uh, I don't know, I I think of them a lot. I I recall once there was a summit between uh, Landon and uh, my mom in New Brunswick, uh, when Landon came to visit Patricia, uh, there was a summit at my house between the two moms. Uh, (laughs) who is this young man? Who is this girl running around with my son? Uh, years later, 
this is uh, close to 20 years ago. I was I was in Ottawa um, at um, one of my first and one of my only victim conferences um, um, called Moving Forward Lessons Learned from Victims of Crime. I think I've talked about this before. You know, you know these are typical, you know what those things are like, Nova conferences or whatever they are. But I was new to it and kind of stepping my foot in the door of, of, of this kind of advocacy and, and having a terrible time of it, just not being able to make any headway or, uh, you know, connect with the right people. And I remember I went to the Pearson's house that evening, I think just, you know, for, for a drink or something. Um, and it's the last time I saw Landon and Jeffrey and, and somehow I, I was expressing that I was really having a hard time here. And, uh, you know, Landon pulled me aside and said, you, you know, she was like, you, uh, you march right back on in there in the morning and you speak to Patricia de Villiers, who at that time was a, a big victim's advocate. Um, her daughter, I believe, was murdered at a Toronto tennis court. Um and so she was a big name and thing. And uh, <clears throat> sure enough, based on uh, Landon's advice, that's exactly what I did. I went up and introduced myself to Priscilla. And uh, it, it did. It it opened a door. You know, I was then sort of let into the, the inner circle of Canadian victimology for a time. I was interested in that, not so much interested in it anymore. Um, some housekeeping. Uh, if you like us, uh, please consider giving us a um, glowing review on iTunes. Uh, seems to be the the platform of uh, need. Um, if you want to follow us on social media, the, the best place to go is to the website uh, teresalore dot com. T h e r e s a a l l o r e point com. From there, you can find the Instagram handle, the follow us on Twitter, Facebook accounts, all of those good, good stuff. Music today is by the band Fox, a British band uh, led by American songwriter Kenny Young, but perhaps best known for their uh, lead singer, who is... Australian, Nusha Fox. Um, I believe this, the music today is from their debut album. Um, I was reintroduced to that album, actually, by um, a schoolmate, classmate of Teresa's, uh, named uh, Josie uh, Jose, one of two people who last saw Teresa alive. We've since become friends, and I'd I'd forgotten about this record from 1975. I really love it. Um, that, it was certainly one of the ones that were kind of passed around the neighborhood. Ended up in Teresa's bedroom. Um, and then recently, uh, Jose, I think, shared it on uh, on Facebook. Um, so that's what we're listening to today. We're listening to Fox, Nusha Fox. That's all I got. This has been Who Killed Teresa. I'm your host, John Elor. Have yourselves a great, great day. Magic.